coming up on today's podcast. A bit of this. Yeah, but would we be here all day? We would. <laughs> we, <Yeah>. would. <laughs> we would be here all day. <laughs> and a bit of this. I mean, that's quite a, it's quite a well-known law, that, isn't it? I, well, it probably is, actually, blocking off the street. I don't know. I don't know, I'm not sure. Street blockage. <laughs> <laughs> street blocking. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode number 15 of Modern Art is Rubbish. Are you alright Tom? Oh hi Marcus, yeah I'm good thanks. Yeah, how, yeah. Oh, you just said you're alright. I was going to ask you how are you but I've just said it so I won't ask you the same question. Oh go again. on, I'll, I'll, you can ask me again, it can be like an art piece. Yeah, how are you Tom? You alright? <laughs> <laughs> You've already asked me that, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, today, we are going to be featuring a artist who likes to wrap things, and he actually has like wrapped giant things like buildings and bridges. So his name is Christo, and uh, Jean Claude is the name that he now goes under, which I will explain later. Um, but first, before we get into the main bit of the show, I just wanted to. Uh, Mention I was contacted, uh, Tom, I don't know if you remember uh, an artist we featured a little while ago who submitted her dad's knitted chessboard as an art piece. Do you remember that? Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. Yes, for my review of the uh, MA show, if anyone's interested. Basically, she got in contact with me yesterday and said that she's got her MA. So, uh, well done to... It's Lucy Delano. Well done to her. But what was really interesting is I actually got sent her dissertation, which is the final, like the final essay that she had to present to uh, to complete her uh, master's degree. It was a kind of conceptual piece. Now, I mean, you did a dissertation, didn't you, for your uh, when you did your music qualification your music degree yeah yeah like it yes it was months of uh pain and struggle to get it done but yeah i did it did yeah. it was a big bit of work with a lot of writing going on well this piece it's certainly got a lot of writing isn't it tom i mean it's a five thousand word uh essay uh it's a conceptual piece and it's title is Five thousand words about art, and now it very interestingly starts with a quote by the uh, American painter Edward Hopper, which says, "If you could say it in words, there would be no reason to paint." Oh, that's uh, yeah, nice quote. What she's actually done here, as she's as I say, the title the essay is called Five Thousand Words About Art," and it literally is. The sentence, 5,000 words about art, 5,000 words about art, 5,000 words about art, until the word count is 5,000, I'd assume. So it's a really risky thing to do. So I take it she's passed with this, otherwise yes. you wouldn't be talking about it. Because no, I, no. I know if I if I handed that in for my final dissertation, I would have definitely got a fail for that. But because you were doing <laughs> music though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that was, what's all this? <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that sometimes to come to this kind of work and this idea can actually take a long time. I remember at college, I was set this idea uh, whereby we were asked to do uh, life drawing and study artworks. And I thought, oh, I can't be bothered to do another life drawing. And I thought, well, you know, I'd already been asked to do, say, about 10 of them for, for this uh, this study. I thought, right, OK, so it will take me about an hour to copy this picture of lion art that I was going to do. So what I did was I spent an hour writing an essay justifying why I didn't do the drawing and just handed in a line. Wow, that's, that's pretty uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes even though it looks like there's not much thought and and it's almost like people might think well that's just a total cop out just uh, sort of reprinting it there can be a lot of work and looking at her other work as well uh certainly I could see why she did it it fits in very well with the the kind of style of her stuff. Well it asks uh philosophical questions doesn't it? Yeah. 
what is there else to say about it yeah yeah i probably don't know the nature of the philosophical questions not knowing the rest of her work her work is quite playful and it 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 raises questions about art history again it's probably for another show to talk about the nature of the art and everything but i think it's quite an interesting one now if anyone wants to uh get in touch and uh, ask more about it i'll put a post on facebook and then we can continue the discussion and i can clarify it a bit more um on facebook for people she's examining art history i mean art history is a big subject yeah i think it's something that would take up a whole show to talk about so maybe it's something we can cover another time okay yeah yeah i want to cover it now and then we just don't do christo oh right yeah i don't know what what is the meaning of art yeah, we'd be here all day. We'd be here all day. Would we? Probably. Yeah, but would we be here all day? We would. We would, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we would be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> main event i don't know if it is event but this artist's work actually is an event so that's christo um slightly off tangent but i will explain why it was uh, it was in the news recently about they gave octopuses ecstasy and apparently when they are given ecstasy they put mdma in their uh, water they want to reach out for cuddles uh, okay, so like an octopus giving you a cuddle, that's quite a thing. It would take a while to get used to, like the eight arms and legs and whatever. <laughs> you don't expect it in an art gallery. Well, no. The, I mean, this was a science experiment. So, but what I exactly, and you don't expect it in an art gallery. And what I think I liked about Christo's work, as we, we are going to discuss, is that because a lot of it is outside, it enabled people to meet people that wouldn't otherwise meet and they'd end up having conversations and connecting in a way so a bit like octopuses would do on ecstasy you've got people from totally different backgrounds that would never otherwise be meeting engaging with each other around uh, a piece of art um it's uh the art is not in a gallery space so it's in a in a cityscape and so yes. it's people that maybe wouldn't normally engage with art are engaging with art, whether they intended to or not. Yes, exactly. And this is what uh, Christo and Jean-Claude, um, their artwork is about. One of the reasons I chose Christo is because I've always been a, a fan of his work. And there currently is on show at the time of recording, although it's going to be taken down in a couple of days in Hyde Park. And what it is is it's 7,506 horizontally stacked oil-sized barrels. And what they do is they've created a patchwork of red, blue and pink circles. And it's on like a floating platform. And it's about 20 metres, 65 feet in height. And it's 30 metres, which is about 98 feet wide. And about 40 metres long, which is about 131 feet long. So this is a massive, massive oil barrel stacked sculpture. And it's in the shape of what's called a mastaba. Now, a mastaba is an ancient shape uh, that was used in Egypt and it was used for tombs. And what it is, is it's a shape that has a flat, it's a building, there's a flat roof, but it's sloping sides. So you can imagine this, this, his sculptures are massive. And also, they're also always temporary or mostly temporary. This giant oil barrel sculpture that he's built, he hopes to build one even bigger in Abu Dhabi. It's going to be 150 metres tall, which is about 492 feet high. And if he builds it, this is in Abu Dhabi, it will be the largest sculpture ever made. And it's going to be taller than uh, the pyramid, uh, Giza or the London Eye just to give you an idea the London Eye is only 135 metres tall so this thing is going to be massive if he builds it and it's going to cost 300 million dollars to build 
So it will end up being the most expensive piece of artwork ever made as well, if it's created. Yeah, well, D- Damien Hurst won't be too pleased about that, will he? No. <laughs> so he'll have to do a series of diamond-encrusted skeletons, won't he? To, uh, <laughs> with not just the skull. <laughs> <laughs> so Christo, so he mostly works with fabric and oil barrels. He can transform landscapes and buildings with fabric, or he does outdoor installations and he's even wrapped things such as coastline or built sort of really, really long fabric fences throughout uh, throughout the landscape. So I guess his work touches on work of architecture and that sort of thing, if he's like changing landscapes and covering buildings. Yeah, he's, he transforms his work and he says his work, art is about transformation and that's what he does. So sometimes when he wraps a building or he wraps an object, he changes its shape and it becomes something else. So you can just see it's just its shape and it simplifies it. Yeah, nice. So uh, I'll give you a little brief. I'm sure you're itching for a brief biog of Christo, aren't you? A little. Oh, yeah. please, please. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's what I want to hear. You're, all, you're in luck, Tom. Here's a quick one. Christo was born June the 13th, 1935 in Bulgaria and his life partner, Jean-Claude, Uh, She was, and she's now sadly dead, she was born June the 13th, 1935 in Casablanca, Morocco. So coincidentally, they were both born on the same day, the same year. So they're they're birth twins, that's the official title. I think it seems almost preordained that, I don't know by who, but by the art gods. Or the the, the birth twin gods. Yeah. In 1953... He began studying art in the Bulgarian capital. And just to give people a perspective, Bulgaria was communist at this time. So obviously quite an oppressive regime. And he always dreamed of going west to Paris because at the time the art scene was, you know, it was it was pretty important. So he, he managed to get into Prague the Czech Republic, which was, again, another communist country, so it's probably easier to go there. And in 1956, he bribed some border guards and managed to sneak into Vienna. And he eventually arrived in Paris and he made a living painting portraits. Now, I haven't... You, I don't know if you've seen any of his works, Tom, but I will show them to you another time. And also, I'll put a link on the website, but he is a really, really good painter and really good uh, 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 draftsman, uh, especially with portraits. So he actually scraped a living, uh, well, made a living as uh, a painter of portraits. So when he was in uh, Paris, he was painting uh, the portrait of Jean-Claude's mother. And that's how he met Jean-Claude. And that's how they became a duo. All right, yeah. So... um so when he's a portrait painter, he's charging people to paint them. Yes. So would he be doing that on the street, like a, like a street artist? I think he seemed to be very good at networking because if you actually think he was, when he came to uh, Paris, he was a penniless uh, uh, immigrant. And uh, something I didn't mention, Jean-Claude was the daughter of a general. I was oh, from an army, army yeah. background, army family background. Yeah, so you can imagine, that, you know, she's moving in quite high society circles. So he's probably quite a little bit of a hustler, um, which I suppose to make giant uh, sculptures out of oil barrels, uh, you would need to be quite a bit of a hustler um, you know, to get that done. Yeah, ready. Um, uh, hello. Uh, hello. If we sound a bit different, it's because we've recorded this over two days due to the fact that somehow I managed not to record the 
second part of the podcast. So I don't know if I should mention that, but I am anyway. Yeah, but I recorded the second part of the podcast. It's yeah. only you that didn't. Yeah, it's only me. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel I feel bad. So we're, I just want to get on to something I said at the start, which is the name Christo and Jean-Claude. Now, what happened was that when Christo started working, he went under the name Christo. And then, because his partner, Jean-Claude, uh, because she was so central to his art practice, he included her name. Um, she has since died, as I have mentioned previously, and now he still continues to use the name today. So that's why he's called Christo and Jean-Claude. But henceforth, I'll be just using the name Christo. So, what happens is, is of course, Christo, as I said previously, he's doing his portraits and he says to Jean-Claude, you know, why don't you come up to my flat and see my real art? Because she thought at the time he was just a uh, portrait painter and he showed her what he's actually doing. So around about 1958, he'd actually started to wrap small items such as cans and shoes sort of everyday objects it even wrapped one of his paintings so the reason he did this was he liked the idea of taking an ordinary everyday object and by wrapping it in something like plastic or wrapping it in fabric he turned it into like a sort of work of sculpture and uh so gradually, he started off with small things like cans, and gradually he built up to things like a, he's even wrapped a motorcycle. It's turned it into a different form. He's wrapped it in a polythene, a kind of plastic, and he's put ropes around it, so it's completely transformed into an object, and it's, you can just see the essential shape of the motorcycle. It's gonna, it's gonna keep the uh, motorcycle dry in the yeah, rain, isn't it's not it? Very good though. I don't see how the wheels would go around like very well. So it's, uh... it's more for parking. Than for moving, <laughs> isn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> so gradually, he's gone from tiny things and he's getting bigger and bigger with motorcycle. And at the same time, he's also, well, not small sculptures, but larger sculptures with oil cans, and he's stacking oil cans as well. Have you got a budgie? Was that a budgie? Yeah, so it's my phone. Hang on. Yeah, me. okay. He started off with these small things and he's he started to go a bit larger. Now, the first major work he did, that Christo did, was called The Wall of Barrels, The Iron Curtain. And that was in 1962. Now, at the time, uh, in 1961, the Berlin Wall had just been uh, created. So you can imagine there's quite a lot of uh, tension going on. So what he decided to do was he effectively blocked off a street in Paris. What, like a, ra- a random street? Was it the street dividing east and west? or No, I just think he found probably a random, like, quiet street that he could get away <laughs> with. It was up for eight hours, and what he did was he took 89 oil barrels and stacked them on top of each other, and they were laying on their side. So if you imagine, you're walking down the street and you'll just be confronted with the circle ends of 89 
oil barrels all stacked up on top of each other, making a wall. So, uh, yeah, that street was pretty much out of action. I can imagine a lot of people appreciated the uh, the detour that that would have caused. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what? So what happened with this? So he he's turned up one morning with his barrels and he's built a wall. Yeah. I, pre- I presume he had some help and technical help to do it. Yeah, he did. And yeah. then, so what happened? After, he then just took it down. Did did he not get in any trouble for doing? Well, it? yeah, he did. This is the thing. He didn't actually get any permission to do it. So he just thought, oh, no. oh well, uh, they asked. He did write. He wrote to the authorities and said, you know. I wonder if you mind uh, mind me blocking off a street with a load of stacked oil barrels. Uh, you know, if you received that letter, I'm sure you'd think thinking, yeah, that's fine. If I wrote to you <laughs> yeah. and said, yeah. <laughs> so they quite unsurprisingly said, who's this Christo? I've never heard of him. Um, and said, no. So he thought, well, I'll just do it anyway. And he actually got arrested uh, because of this and the police uh, I, I don't know what the crime was probably blocking off a street without permission and in the end they didn't actually charge him and he just I mean, removed his oil a, barrels it's quite a well known law that isn't it I, well it probably is actually blocking off a street I don't know I the don't know I'm not sure street blockage <laughs> <laughs> street blocking <laughs> done his sort of first big kind of installation um now you can imagine there's a lot of organization that goes into his work now when you look at the dates of his work you know like most a painting will probably just have a year it was done but with christo's work it actually can cover the date of the work can cover 10 years so for instance uh the next one we're going to look at is uh the wrapping of Pont Neuf, which is the the ninth uh, bridge in Paris. And this is the oldest uh, standing bridge in Paris, and it goes across the Seine. This is a nice stone bridge with arches. It was actually uh, completed in 1606. Now, Christo has an idea to wrap it in fabric, the whole bridge. So you can imagine... Uh, that takes quite a long time. And in fact, this piece is dated 1975 to 1985. So it's taken like 10 years for it to actually be fully realised. Wow, yeah, that's a long time because I I imagine it's not going to take you 10 years to wrap a bridge. I mean, unless it's an absolutely massive bridge. I guess it's all the planning that took so long. Yeah, and all the planning is actually part of the artwork as well. So that's why it's dated 75 to 1985. Um, So what you you can imagine, the first things, he has to draw sketches and he has to make uh, uh, drawings and collages showing what the bridge would look like so people can see it and look at all the logistics of it. So have all the descriptions of how much it's going to cost, what it's going to take to build it. And then when he's got these plans, he has to approach the all the authorities. If, for instance, he has to he has to be in negotiation with people such as the mayor of Paris at the time. And then also he needs to get the public on side, the local public. So he needs to speak to people and hold meetings to inform people of what's going to happen. All this takes years and years and years to to do. And he sees it as part of the artwork because, you know, people's impressions of what they think might happen count and, and you know, how people respond to even the idea. That's even part of it. 
what he does is eventually, after all this time, he does get permission. What he did was he wrapped the whole bridge in a, a sort of beige, silky fabric. And it's incredible. Suddenly, this bridge is now being transformed, a sort of incredible piece of art and it's uh, it's like it's in a second skin and it's almost got the, the the fabric that's wrapped this bridge has a kind of movement on it i guess that's, the, that's the wind yeah that's the wind that is the wind yeah <laughs> yeah i mean because this bridge is quite an important piece you can imagine people will be walking on it on a daily basis and i actually watched a film called christo in paris um, it's a film that I really recommend people check out. It came out in 1990. And what I found particularly interesting was because this art is in the middle of Paris, you've got people that wouldn't normally engage with modern art. They're now talking to each other and they're now enjoying the bridge. People start to engage. You get an art lover talking to someone who never really engaged with art, who doesn't like it. It's quite a place where people from different sort of parts of the uh, of society uh, were meeting and discussing and from different lives were meeting and discussing art uh, I mean there's even one scene in this film which as I said I really recommend uh, where there were like uh, nuns there were nuns crossing it and I'll tell you what these nuns they seemed very um, some smiled and some nuns didn't smile and I thought that was quite an interesting thing because nuns are quite a uh, a neutral gauge of of bridges. Yeah, they are. They're also quite uh, nice to go with the Christo work because they're wrapped as well, aren't they? Like oh, his yeah. work is. <laughs> 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 so uh, coincidentally, um, there's another bit in the film. Speaking of nuns, uh, where they said to Christo, "So Christo, they call you the Pope of Contemporary Art now," and he said. If I was the Pope of Contemporary Art, I wouldn't have taken me uh, 10 years to get permission. If it had been designed by Cardin or even Dior, you would have loved it. Look, this is something personal. I like the bridge as it was built and not with this stupid art thing. <laughs> now, I want to... Something I want to talk about now is the incredible scale of the work. I can't... I want to talk about a piece that shows just how truly big his work is. And it's called... Uh, it's a piece called Running Fence. Now, this was a, a white curtain that was built in the north of San Francisco and it stretched across the property of 59 ranches and ended up dropping down into the Pacific Ocean. Now, it was made, so you can imagine, this big white sort of like fence or curtain stretching across all this land. So as far as the eye can see, it's pretty a pretty amazing sight cutting through the landscape. Now, the curtain was 5.5 metres tall, which is 18 feet high. It was about 39 and a half kilometres long, which is about 24 and a half miles long. And it used 145 kilometres of cable, which is about 90 miles of steel cable, that is. 2,060 poles and 14,000 earth anchors, which are things that go into the ground to hold it in place. And what's amazing about the work as well is that when removed, it leaves no trace or no damage whatsoever as well. That was part of the deal. So you can imagine the amount of work these had to go to speak to 59 owners, ranch owners, as well as checking out with the council and making sure that they all agree to his work, you know, and agree to agree to it being put up and they're quite happy. It's an that, amazing piece. It's an amazing feat in itself, isn't it? Getting permission of 60 landowners or 59 yeah, landowners yeah, to, oh, yeah. to, to put this curtain across the land. Yeah, 
Well, that's a big, big split. I mean, the thing is, is as well, is going to the builders would have been a, uh, a bit of a, uh, a problem. Um, what, to order a <laughs> hundred and whatever kilometres of cable? Yeah, yeah, you can imagine <laughs> it. <laughs> but yeah. So, again, you can imagine the, the amount of work that, that Christo does uh, uh, with this, you can you can imagine what what goes into to building the, the sheer scale of these stuff. Yeah, you can't go to any shop and get all this equipment that he needs, or the all the uh, no. what do you call it, the um, materials for these oh, yeah. pieces. These are like this is very specialist, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm- oh yeah, can I just say about the um, the nylon yeah. curtain across the yes, country? yeah. That just looks. I've got the a, a picture of it that you sent to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. It just looks so spectacular. It's kind of looks like you know you see pictures of the Great Wall of China. Yes. Yeah, it kind of looks like that, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. What is really special about his works is it makes you reassess the whole uh, the whole way you look at a landscape or you look at an object, and that's part of the thing. You view the landscape in a completely different way when you see it. It makes you see things in a new light, and that's what he loves is the transformative uh, power of his art. It also gives um, hikers and country walkers a chance of a curtain to get changed behind if they need to get changed (laughs) (laughs) mid-walk. Yeah, but you've got to walk 39 miles to get behind the curtain. (laughs) (laughs) Finally... There are other pieces that Christo's done that I do want to mention. I mean, one of my particular favourites was the simultaneous installation of giant yellow and blue umbrellas in in Japan and the USA. They're like about six metres high and about eight and a half metres across. They're huge. Yeah, so like when you, when you say umbrellas, they're like those like little sun sun like what do you call. Them? I would describe them more like the giant things you get in uh, in outdoor pubs you know that kind of yeah what do you you call them there's a name for those we should know the name we're called umbrellas but they're almost like kind of sunshades they've got that kind of look sunshades yeah Yeah, they're like many many sunshades covering the landscape huge i mean in japan stretched over 19 kilometers which is about 12 miles and and in the usa it it was about 18 miles you know so it's almost like he works on the scale of giants because you can imagine if humans were like i don't know 100 times bigger than they are they'd be like the little drink umbrellas wouldn't they (laughs) (laughs) so you can imagine it's just an incredible sight so i've got a link on the website about that and another one i do want to mention is the time he actually wrapped the german parliament building the reichstag um that was quite incredible and people were having picnics and they were having meetings outside it. Now, the Reichstag is the German parliament building. So you can... So, so was this after the Berlin Wall came yes, down? Yes, it was. No, this was, this was in, in the 1990s he did that. It was quite incredible. You can imagine, like, the German parliament would have quite a lot of uh, time for Christo after his, like... Um you know, uh, Berlin Wall type piece. Yeah, well, I think what it was was when the Berlin, when the Reichstag was actually wrapped, it was before it was going to have a complete uh, kind of refurbishment and then be reopened as the German Parliament building. So, so it was in the building's downtime. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, just one extra point: uh, Christo pays for all the works himself. Um, he does this by selling his collages and his drawings and he doesn't have any galleries representing him he does it all himself this way uh, this way he can keep control of all his projects yeah so he must be very popular with the oil barrel merchants yeah, yeah. and, and the <laughs> nylon merchants well yeah he Ah, Mr. Christo you again <laughs> what can I get for you today <laughs> Please, everyone else leave. We have Mr. Christo here. Mr. Christo, come this way. How much nylon do you want today? We have many umbrellas at the back. We have thousands. Please, please, Mr. Christo, sir, come this way. Yeah, so he must he must need a big team. 
you must have site managers and people in hard hats oh yes his. i mean to set this up it takes a lot of a lot of logistics uh, and year that's what oh mr years. christo we have we have the hard hats as well uh, how many do you want this time <laughs> <laughs> So, Tom, anything to uh, to add to this uh, Christo podcast? Um, then? Well, I, I, you know, I think all this works very beautiful. Uh, I like the transformative nature, and uh, I particularly like the uh, the curtain across the countryside, across the valley. In where is it? It's in California, isn't it? It's very, it's very pretty that one. And the uh, the German building, the it's it's like the German equivalent of our parliament. Yeah, it's the administration. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's it's yeah, it's nice. You could take uh, lots of different meanings from that one, couldn't you? But yeah, it'd be quite nice just to wrap up uh, all the parliament buildings uh, so they wouldn't meet. Or we could wrap up our subjects concisely at the end of each episode in his, in his fabric. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, just to add, uh, if you can please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and don't forget to subscribe. And there's full show notes, well, and the show notes uh, with the links to the works we've discussed plus extra videos and extra pictures on the website. You've got to check out Christo's work. It's great. And, and follow us on Spotify. Oh, yeah, Spotify. We seem to be quite popular on Spotify at the moment. Yeah, Sp- Spotify going all out with us podcasters. So it's, it's, it's a really great platform to get involved with podcasting. If you're interested in listening to other podcasts, it's really good. Yeah, it is really good. Um, also, uh, our, our web address is modernartisrubbish.com. You can join us on Facebook. And finally, um, it does cost us money to do this show and uh, can support us via our Patreon page. Just look for Modern Art is Rubbish podcast on there. That's it, I think. I just want to say uh, thanks um, for listening. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Marcus. I'll, uh, and thanks to everyone for listening, and I'll uh, speak to you all soon. Yeah, so it's just time for the buys then. So, bye. Cut.